Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Moore Fitzgerald, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion with three of my absolute favourite writers. And um, when the wonderful Mila said to me that I would be getting a chance to talk to all of you, I, I jumped at the opportunity because of just oh, how special your work is and how important I think it is. And because the theme is not just about uh, writing and stories, it's also about mental health. I couldn't think of uh, three better storytellers to be talking to. The other thing that I'd like to say is that, you know, I think it's almost a cliche now that uh, Ireland is going through a kind of a renaissance or some kind of incredible um, moment in in uh, writing for young adults as well as writing um, generally. And um, you guys are kind of proof of that, really. So um, I'm I'm not going to spend too much more time gushing. I just want to start introducing you. Uh, three, and then we'll get into a conversation. Really what the panel today is about, um, for all of you who are going to be tuning in, is to hear more from these authors about uh, the stories that they've written and about the impact that those stories could have or have had on people. And also to hear uh, their voices reading from the work that they've written, which I always think is such a unique privilege, you know, to actually hear the voice of the writer uh, reading work that they have um, that they have written and, and given rise to. So, guys, you're all really welcome. H how are you all doing? Great. Good. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. Um, I'm going to do a slightly formal introduction because it's so nice for, for uh, people tuning in to know um, a little bit more about your backgrounds and, and who you are, even if they know you or they think they know you. So, James, it's good to see you. James Butler is a writer and has been a primary school teacher, and he's from Dublin. He holds an MPhil in creative writing from Trinity College. Uh, his book for young adult readers, although I hasten to add that all these books could be read by people of any age, and we might talk about the age issue uh, later on in the discussion, but his book is called Dangerous Games. It was published uh, last year by Little Island Press and was a winner in the Great Reads Awards of 2019. James's radio play The Carpet Clown was produced by RTE Radio Drama on One as part of the PJ O'Connor Awards in 2016. And his play for children, Stuck in the Mud, was produced by Barnstorm Theatre Kilkenny in 2005. He currently writes for and facilitates the teenage members of Stage 51 Theatre Group, Knockline in Dublin. A variety of the plays produced are available on New Theatre Ireland, uh, Ireland's online platform, Playshare, so you should definitely uh, check those out as well. Uh, James, how are you and how is lockdown treating you? Uh, not too bad, I'm actually. Uh, I'm I was a teacher, so I retired. So I'm, the fact that I'm writing now actually is kind of, well, I say full time. It's still, <clears throat> there are days when I should be doing a lot more. Uh, that lockdown has, has funny effects are on my writing output. Some, uh, there are days when I don't just feel like doing it, but it's, uh, it's not too bad. I'm, I'm actually spending a couple of hours each day, you know, when I'm getting out for walks and that. But uh, so I think it's the fact that I'm, retired and at home anyway, so it probably has less of a, an effect on me than it has on people frontline people or people who have to go out to work or teachers or pupils or um so there's that you know that's which, yeah which is a good thing. Well good on me yeah, in, in a way yeah in some ways I think lockdown has been a kind of a mixed blessing and it's I I've talked to a lot of writers in particular who are saying that they were you know, they've spent their whole lives looking for an excuse to close the door on the world, and now they have it, so maybe there are hidden blessings in it. James, we're really looking forward to talking to you more in a little while. My next guest is Kira Smith. Uh, Kira is a mental health social worker by day and writer by night. Uh, she's also a cat, cat enthusiast 24-7. Uh, she says, um, I, I think the fact that um, Kira has a day job, I mean, of the nature an intensity that she has um, enables her to bring a certain kind of energy to her writing and I'd love to talk to her more about that later on today. Her debut novel is called The Falling in Love Montage and my daughter who works in O'Mahony's bookshop says that it is 
flying at the doors in Limerick at the moment, so you'll be glad to hear that, uh, Kira. It's a story about memory, rom-coms, and girls who like girls, and it was published uh, during, as she says herself, the 4th March of 2020, which is what was once known as June. It's been nominated for the Irish Book Award uh, Young Adult Book of the Year, which is a really big honour. Her second novel, Not My Problem, is coming out in May 2021, and it's about a girl who tries to fix everyone else's problems because she doesn't know what to do about her own. There's something very universal and relatable in the way that Kira um, delivers these kinds of wonderful stories. Kira, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, lockdown for me certainly has not really changed anything. <laughs> um, I think just because because I'm in the north and I work for the health service, so um, it's just been business as usual. It's probably been busier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and kind of you know, frontliners are not getting a break of any kind. Um, and I also find because I'm teaching at the moment uh, in in UL and. It takes so much longer to do things online than it does when you're in person. There's so many shortcuts you can kind of take for granted when you meet people in the flesh, but it's so much clunkier online. So are you doing a lot of your work online at the moment, Kira? Um we were doing um a lot of stuff by phone initially. Um at the minute we are able to see people in person, which is good because you know, I work in mental health, so when people are struggling, it's really hard to kind of do anything productive on the phone. People just kind of were like, yeah, no, I'm fine. Okay, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> um, so I am glad that we are able to see people in person. I think it makes a huge difference. Yeah, uh, well, that's good, Kira, And uh, can't wait to hear more from your work in a little while. My next guest is Keithan Leahy. Keithan is an author and filmmaker from Cork. Are you in Cork at the moment, Keithan? I am indeed. <laughs> All right. Uh, is the sun shining there as well? No, I'm actually in possibly well, the darkest room in the house, but I have a, a massive light on in the corner. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Keithan's debut novel uh, is called Tuesdays Are Just As Bad. I love that title. It was published by Mercier Press in 2018 to great acclaim. It was shortlisted for the CBI Book of the Year Award in 2019 and won the senior category of the Great Reads Awards in 2020. He has written five Fiction Express books for middle grades, including The Chosen One and Tricks. Keaton's animation short, The Beast of Bath, was broadcast on national television and his short film, The Amazing, appeared in Cork, film anthology Cork, like in 2013. He has also been awarded an individual artist's bursary from Cork City Council in 2020. Congratulations for that, Keith, and that's going to give you uh, a kind of a transfusion of creative um, enablement at a time that, uh, that when artists need it a lot. Yeah, that's great. That's great news for you. When did you find out about that? Oh, it was um, it was during the year, but it was uh, it was uh, it was great. It's just it kind of coincided with the lockdown happening. It's like, oh wow, this is very helpful right now. <laughs> yeah, superb. Uh, and has you know, it been helpful? Uh, how's the lockdown been? Um, it has been it's been kind of up and down. <laughs> uh, I I feel like I had at the start of it I found it quite difficult to write, but then I at some point there was kind of some kind of breakthrough of it, and then I found I think summertime in the middle of the summer I think when the lockdown started to ease a bit, uh, the writing started flowing a bit more. Uh, it's all it's it's also been like a weird question of. I think people have been saying about whether you should write about the lockdown or not. So it's been kind of a weird, oh, should I write about this or should I write in big game? So it's a, been an experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's such an interesting thing because I think people are going in two directions on that question. They're going right into the dystopia of the lockdown experience and all that it could mean. Or they're writing kind of so far away from the lockdown where there's high levels of connectedness and almost sort of um, nostalgia around the way the world used to be, which seems like such a long time ago, even though it's only last March. So that's really interesting. I've heard yeah. lots of writers talk about that issue. Guys, what I'd love to do now is to get each of you to tell us a little bit about your latest book. Um, and each of you have very recent uh, books that have gone out into the world. And then I'd love to invite you uh, in turn just to read um, from 
um, an extract um, of your choice. I know that it was something that you had all said that you're happy to do. So can I start with you, James? Can you tell us a bit more about Dangerous Games um, you know, the characters in it, your wonderful depictions of Kevin and his brother Adam, and then maybe give us a little bit of the actual text. Yeah, it's probably set in the area I, I spent so long teaching in. So, boy, Kevin, he's 14. Um, his dad is, has died, and he's dead since he was four. Uh, lives with his mum and his older brother Adam, who is a little bit um, wild and into. You know, uh, drink and probably stealing cars and that. And um, he's, he's there with his mother, but his uncle Davy comes back from from England, and Kevin doesn't realise that Davy has been there for ten years, but he's been in prison there. And I suppose Kevin, for me, Kevin is desperate for some kind of a, an adult role model, and I probably can invest a lot. That's all of this probably in the character of Davy because I suppose Davy reminds him it's his dad's brother. Uh, Davy shows an interest in moving into the house, but uh, he, he's and, and it's about kind of Kevin initially trying to figure out okay what kind of an influence is it someone that he can he can who has a good moral compass because Kevin's moral compass in, in itself is skewed a bit. Uh, so you actually it starts off funny anyway, he's one call Rory, they're sitting in a field at the back of one of the schools and they're chatting away. And a car comes, a stolen car comes into the field and it's driven by Adam, his brother. And I suppose instead of running away, he's probably seen this kind of stuff before. So instead of running away, he actually goes over and, and opens the boot and, and he takes a, a kit bag, football gear, from that's what he takes away uh, from the it's kind of booty he takes home. And he takes ownership of it. And there's also kind of bank material pages uh, with a name on it, and uh, he he takes that as well. And the the it follows then the idea of the the book. It I suppose Rory, his friend, guilts him into maybe deciding that he has to give the football there back because the jersey has the name Connor written on it. So it's obviously not Kevin's uh, jersey, or no, but nobody will. People will know it's, it's stolen or whatever. So the book, the, the book um, comes about uh, Kevin trying to find his boy and give the give it back. And it's about this. It's probably the moral is if you have something, uh, you should give it back because it can impinge or impact your own kind of sense of morality. Uh, you know, like in Lord of the Rings, ownership of the ring has a very detrimental effect on on the person who has it. So I suppose there's that notion that. If you have something that doesn't belong to you, well, then you need to give it back for, uh, I suppose, you know, just, for, well, I suppose you need to want to say, attack your own mental health going forward. Yeah. And then there's the other, uh, Davy has promised that he will return the, the, the bank material to the, to, to the, to the owner, as, because, uh, I suppose he's trying to impress Kevin's mum. But, as both stories, as it goes on, both stories interconnect, and Kevin gets to meet the boy Connor, um, and it just goes on from there. It, it just uh, things kind of get out of hand. I suppose that's that's the, that's the, the, the start of the story, and anyway. I just uh, I won't say any more at the moment. Yeah, or I mean, it's and I. I don't like to to uh, it's it's really set that up beautifully, um, and uh, James, it's so hard to talk about our own work. So you've done you've summarised the premise and the principle so well. I I just think it's a story that really explores. It confronts a lot of, you know. I think it, it it's really important for us to have texts that aren't and and novels for young adults that aren't about that kind of you know that conventional um, demography of you know. Uh, kids with two parents um, who live in comfortable homes, um, often very middle class. And I think that we're seeing a whole range of novels now that are saying are, are representing different life experiences. And this is such a good example of one of those. It explores so many deep themes of grief and danger and trouble and morality, as you say, and redemption in difficult times. And I just think the character of Kevin is so beautifully drawn. And I can't wait to hear you read a little bit from the book. Um, James, so we'll come back to you uh, for the reading. You can kind of get your head in the game for that. And I will talk next to Kira. Um, Kira, could you tell us about the wonderful 
the falling in love montage, please. Um, well, the falling in love montage is about Saoirse, who doesn't really believe in love or relationships, or rather she, she kind of thinks they don't last. Um, and what's the point of doing something if it's, if it's going to end, you know, it's going to end. Um, and part of that is because her mom has early onset dementia and her dad is getting remarried and she feels kind of bereft and her, her girlfriend who's her best friend broke up with her and basically everything is falling apart. Um, but she meets a girl called Ruby who kind of says to her, well, yeah, but if you do know it's definitely going to end and you know when, then you can't really get hurt because we're both on the same page. So Ruby is a massive rom-com fan and they, they agree to do or to sort of have a relationship that is based on the falling in love montage of a romantic comedy where you just kind of do fun things and it's, it's not very deep. Um, and they both know it'll end at the end of the summer. So, I mean, that will definitely work out you know, perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. I just, again, you know, one of the things that I say to my students in UL, particularly students who are writing for young adults, is don't be afraid of the dark, you know. Um, don't keep your books safe or sanitised. And I think that this is another really good example of really reaching for the emotional truth of people's experience. Um, tackling the issue of dementia, as well as falling in love uh, together in the same character that, you know, in terms of what she's facing and what she's dealing with in her family and in her life. That, I think, was a hugely uh, brave and interesting thing to do, Kira. Um, and also, I think what's lovely as well is it confronts in a really kind of kind and eyebrow raised way all of the memes that were given. Uh, in life, particularly young people, about what it is to fall in love, you know. So I thought that was just so interesting and so intelligent. And again, I can't wait to hear an extract. Keaton, tell us about Tuesdays Are Just As Bad. Uh, so Tuesdays Are Just As Bad is about a boy who um, he die. He, commit, he, he he tries to commit suicide and dies. And as a result, his ghost appears. But when he wakes up, the ghost is still there. So... This is, uh, so the story is told from the perspective of the ghost as we see uh, Adam, who's the boy, uh, go through his uh, recovery afterwards. Uh, this is how Adam, you see him rebuild his life and then make friends and relationships and things like that. And the ghost acts in a way as a very kind of flexible metaphor thing uh, so that you can see that the ghost is excited about him but then he starts getting jealous of the attention and then starts trying to push him back down the road of uh, depression. So it is, yeah, so it was kind of, it came out of a, I, I, I'd read, you know, there's a lot of stories in art and stuff like that about suicide. And I kind of wanted to do one that was about what happens afterwards of the kind of recovery, like it's always, this is just the aftermath, so it's called Tuesday. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Thanks, Keith. And again, you know, the, this is so, uh, you know, this diversity of emotional experience for me is what's so interesting. So grief and dementia and caring and then uh, suicidality in the case of Keith's work and how funny this book is and how much you have balanced in this gorgeous way, the dark and the light, you know, because there are moments, there are really, really important laugh out loud moments in the midst of the dark. And I think... There's something really rescuing about that for um, some somebody vulnerable reading this book, I think, would get huge um, comfort and relief and kind of um, joy from reading it. So um, I'm dying to hear you read an extract. I'm going to go back to James now and ask him to read a piece from the very wonderful Dangerous Games. Just to set this up uh, briefly, it's, I was thinking the book is really, it's a celebration of kind of resilience, the kids' resilience that I would have encountered. And probably also just someone who hasn't, their dad died when he was very young. He, he's really experiencing some of that grief and he, in, in the, the boy he befriends who he realizes, realizes that maybe his dad has died too. 
Uh, so it's more he sees it verbalized and made physical the reaction of grief in that other point. Probably it just helps. This is the bit where he's, uh, this thing of resilience. Kevin is a very he's a small lad, but he just wants to be a goalkeeper. So it's just something about about that I thought it's quite funny as well. Okay. I didn't want to say too much about the score, except that I lost count after three more goals flew past me. S Steve said they weren't my fault. I felt like walking off too long before it ended, but I knew it wouldn't be right to do that. And I felt sorry for Jenny. She was doing her best to cover for her husband while he was away doing whatever he was doing. And I taught Connor with Scabby to have walked out of his teammates like that. Jenny appeared back on the line shortly after the second half started, but there was no sign of Connor. She watched the game, but you could see her heart wasn't in it, because every few minutes she'd look off towards the changing room or towards the goal, like as if she might spot Connor lurking there. Then the game was over, and Steve said, well played, and I said, yeah, and the two of us laughed. After I changed back into my clothes, I sat listening to the boys giving out about the game and about Jenny. Steve said he was going to look for a different team to play for, and everyone else agreed, and said they were going to do the same. Nobody asked me what I was going to do. But won't Connor's dad be upset if you all leave, I asked Steve. Like, what's he going to say when he hears that? Steve stared at me like I was stupid. Connor's dad is dead. Did you not know that? Dead? Yeah, he dropped down dead a couple of months ago. He just collapsed and died out in his garden. Connor was with him when it happened. Jesus. Yeah, and Jenny, she thought you could keep the team going, like for his sake, because maybe that's what he would have wanted, but you saw what's after happening. I put my head down into my hands. Dead. The man in the photo, Connor's dad, dead. I couldn't believe how stupid I had been not to see it. I stared down at the kit bag and felt really bad that I still had it, and I hadn't brought the ball or the photo. Hey, well done, Jenny, was there looking down at me, and everyone else was gone. Sorry about Connery. He's still just very upset over his dad. You, you heard about that. I nodded. And then his dad's lovely car was stolen with Connor's football jersey and all the other stuff that was special to him in it. In a bag exactly like your one there. And we got news that they found the car burned out and I presume everything in it got burned because there was no sign of anything. I stood up and wanted to tell her everything that had happened, but I was afraid. I lifted the bag off the floor. It felt really heavy now. Is Connor okay? Thanks for asking, Kevin. You're the only one who did. But yeah, he walked home. It's not very far, so I gave him the key and let him go. And thanks for playing. I'm sorry, but I don't think I'll need you again. I think my career as a manager is over before it even began. She let out a big, long sigh, and I felt sorry for her. She put out her hand, and I shook it. It felt soft and warm, and she gave my hand a little squeeze before she let it go. She tried to smile, but it had fake written all over it. You want me to give you a lift somewhere? I can drop you to a bus. Can you drop me to your house and I'll walk from there? Oh, you know where I live? Yeah, I like. I put the kit bag into the back seat and sat in the front. The seats were soft, creamy leather, and the car smelled of Jenny's perfume. Neither of us spoke a word as we drove past the shopping centre, onto the really quiet road that had loads of trees on it, and huge houses with long front gardens and driveways you could park a bus on. She pulled into a drive-in with all coloured pebbles and cobble lock, like Rory's, but lots more of it, and nicer with different coloured bricks making fancy designs. Someone had pulled a yellow hose down the side of the house and lay coiled on the grass like a snake. The grass looked so green like it was painted, and right in the middle of it were two tall trees like twins, all white and silvery from the way the sun was shining on I got out of the car and said thanks and then went to walk away, but I'd only taken a few steps when she beat them. When I turned around, she was getting out of the driver's seat and she had the pit bag in her hand. Hey, Kevin, you forgot your football here. Her smile was working yet. I hope we weren't that bad that you don't ever want to see it again. I glanced at the bag and then I wasn't sure where to look. Maybe Connor would like it because it's, you know, Steve said he likes and I knew and that's crap. I mean, that was just terrible about the car and I don't know if I'm ever going to play a football again. Oh my gosh, Jenny said and she handed me the bag and then put her arms around me and hugged me really tight. You're a little angel, you know that, a sweet little angel. Now go and get your bus. Connor will be all right, he just needs time. She was just about to start crying. I knew that look from that. I took the bag, even though I wanted to tell her it wasn't mine. Then I turned and walked off. Before I went down her gate, I looked back and she was still standing there watching. I waved at her and she waved back. And then I ran, hoping I'd find a bus stop nearby. Okay. Oh, Jane. I mean, he's heartbreaking and he's... You know, he the thing about Kevin is he always wants to do the right thing, even though he's challenged with 
voices and you know he he obviously you know his link with Adam and his uncertainty about you know what's right and wrong is really assaulted I think at different stages in the story but I love that he's so clear-eyed and he notices so much and he's always watching and he he wants to do what's right by people and he's got this incredible empathy and I think we often rob our boys of being able to express that which is one of the reasons I think your book is so important because it gives us, it holds up a mirror to boys like Kevin, of whom there are so many, um, and helps them to make meaning of some of the challenges that they face in their own life. And that's, I suppose that's one of the purposes of a book like that. I mean, I know storytellers just have to write their stories and there is no, uh, you know, there's a, I don't like stories that are pious and that have, you know, morals to them in very kind of clunky ways but at no point do you ever slip into that James I think in your narrative it's just telling a brilliant story but it's got this gentle morality about it as a backdrop and I just think it's just so moving you know James and, and thank you for reading that that's such a lovely extract and it really tells us a lot I think about Kevin and whoever's tuning in I really encourage you to to pick this book up, especially, I mean, I don't want to be gendered about it, but I just think boys who might not necessarily be, be big readers, if they reach for this book, I think it'd be a really good access point if you feel like maybe, I, you know, I'd love to, to try maybe if you haven't read for a while or if you've read when you were younger and you feel like maybe now is the time to get back to it. I, I couldn't recommend um, a book uh, that, that would be better than this one to to really to get going on. Um, James, thanks a million. I want to come back to you about what it was like to write it and, and maybe some of your influences. But I, I want to give uh, Kira a little space now to read from her The Falling in Love montage and Saoirse and Ruby and the wonderful dynamic that um, we see between these two great characters. Kira, the floor is yours. Let's hear you. <laughs> Well, I've never been asked to read before, so I had no idea what to pick. But um, I decided to pick a bit that's uh, a scene between um, Saoirse and Oliver, who is her frenemy, because he's just one of my favourites. Um, and this is uh, the obligatory post-leaving cert party um, at Oliver's house. A quarter of my bottle of vodka and several dull conversations about exams later, I escape upstairs. Technically, there was a baby gate with a makeshift sign warning not to go up, but there was a really long queue for the toilet, so I used my initiative. After I left the ornate bathroom, I stood on the landing, drawn to the faint sounds of a piano coming from one of the rooms. Oliver was in the music room. No surprise there. I'd tried him there before. He threw these parties, and then he'd invariably get bored and leave. He looked tired as he tinkled on the piano, and half an empty drink sat on the lid, sweating onto a coaster. He had a real glass, though there wasn't a single one to be found downstairs. So when are mommy and daddy getting back this time, sad little rich boy? I said, sitting beside him on the piano bench. He barely looked at me, but I caught the hint of a smile. Tomorrow, he tucked a lot, a lock of ashy blonde hair behind his ear. I think they're going to notice downstairs is kind of a bomb site, I said. I have a cleaner coming in the morning. Must be nice to have so much money you forget how to clean up after yourself, I sighed wistfully. Saoirse, it's nice to be rich enough that I'm not annoyed you stole a bottle of Ciroc 10 from me. He tapped the Coke bottle in my hand, which created an odd gap in the music. How he knew I'd filled it with his expensive vodka, I don't know. Let's call it an educated guess. Dude, this is vodka. It goes down like water. I bet. Besides, I said, stretching my arms overhead, you owe me. Still? His fingers fluttered over the keys impressively. Not that I'd ever tell him it was impressive, of course. Forever. You stole Gracie Belt Gorbin from me and I never really got over it. My cold, shriveled heart still mourns for her. I'm sure. I hear there are plenty of girls since to take her place. Oliver acted like I was some kind of lesbian playboy with a harm of curious ladies lighting up each night. His perception of my love life couldn't be more wrong. I haven't done anything more than a sneaky shift since Hannah and I split. Okay, so the list of kissing partners was long, but so what? I think the indiscriminate snogging started the rumour that I was getting it regularly, but in truth, a bit of the over-the-bra action was as far as it ever went. Oliver paused in his complicated sonata and then played the first confident notes of heart and soul. After a few moments, I joined in, my fingers sloppy over the keys. I was tipsy and missed half the notes, and Oliver laughed. We'd both gone to the same piano teacher at school when we were eight. 
Heart and soul was about as much as I could remember. I'd quit after a few weeks. Oliver had been practicing, obviously. After our impromptu duet, we drank in silence for a few minutes. Oliver started playing again, and I took it as my cue to leave. When I reached the door, the music stopped abruptly, so I looked back. Oliver was frowning, fingers frozen, hovering above the keys. Her name was Gracie Bell Siccarelli, he said. What? No, it wasn't. I shook my head emphatically. But after all the vodka, it kind of made me dizzy. Yeah, it was. Her dad was this big Italian dude. They had an ice cream place on the promenade. Siccarelli's. Huh. Well, that doesn't sound a bit like Corbin, does it? First love can be so confusing. Oh, well fun. That's brilliant. The authenticity of your dialogue, Kira. You know, again, that's a masterclass. It's just, it, and I think that young adults uh, can smell inauthenticity from a mile off. They just don't buy stuff that, you know, they're not going to be condescended to. They're not going to be patronized. And there's something so, I mean, I hear my own kids who are young adults now, and there's something so slick and sophisticated and sort of, funny and cynical about the way they've learned to interact with the world. And there's something about that that you capture so brilliantly. The other thing, of course, I love is how you normalize sexuality um, in a way that, you know, you're not drawing particular attention to it. It's just that they're you know, normal kids having a normal relationship and engaging in all the stuff that falling in love um, involves with this fantastic kind of it's a lighthearted backdrop, but you're dealing with such dark topics as well. So um, what an amazing thing to have pulled off, Kira. Um, I'm going to come back to you, as I say, about some of the influences that might have led you to these stories. But I wanted to hear from Keith in as well um, and, and get him to read a little bit from Adam's story. Uh, yes. Um, so this is actually a piece I don't usually read, but uh, it's, it's kind of it's one of my favorite chapters in it. So. Uh, so this is about kind of towards in the first half of the book where Adam starts making friends. And this actually came out of interesting like editorial notes about uh, how did they all become friends? So this became the inspiration for this chapter. <clears throat> so it took a while for Adam to get used to the idea that he had friends. Instead of watching a movie, he was able to go, hey, I wonder what the gang is up to. I should join them in this activity. We weren't sure how it happened either. It was like he walked around the corner without looking where he was going and slammed into the famous five. The movies and TV shows we watched suggested that becoming friends with people involved a long list of favours or pretending to become friends with, for some strategic advantage or being born next door to some doe-eyed brown-haired girl. I think Adam was particularly confused, although, to be fair, he didn't have many friends before, so he had no experience to compare it to. One day... After school, when they were hanging out, in the, uh, hanging out in the subway, Adam asked how the rest of them had become friends. They provided a convoluted oral history, which I present to you completely unedited. <clears throat> Barry, I don't know. Uh, we all, I think we all just stood in place on Paul Street, and eventually we ended up speaking to each other. Eva, no, wait, I knew Linda from dance class. Linda, oh, that's right. Our mothers had serious notions of us becoming great dancers. We were going to be the next... Uh, whoever a famous ballerina is. Uh, we started talking when we fell into each other, attempting a simultaneous pirouette. Eva, I was not the graceful swan. I was laid, led to believe by my mother, Linda. I giggled so much that the dance instructor sent us to the dressing room for a full 15 minutes. Anyway, afterwards, Eva was being picked up by her very attractive older brother. So there and then, I made it my business to make friends with her. Eva, she was not subtle about it. Linda, I was not. Eva, he was frightened. Linda, he misunderstood my intention. Eva, you stole his hamster. Linda, correction, I borrowed his hamster. I thought he would naturally fall in love with the woman who rescued his beloved pet. Eva, we put up missing posters and all for it. Douglas, and then I entered in a triumph. <laughs> Linda, what? <laughs> Douglas, I'm starting to derail this unsettling tale of attempted hamster side. Linda, hey, I, it was at most a hamster napping. Douglas, but this origin story has been going too long without getting to the real meat of the legend. When I deigned to become friends with you, you see, it all began in Madagascar. <laughs> Linda, Douglas lives on the same park as me. So Aoife and I started hanging out there. Being the cool chicks that we are, Douglas naturally gravitated to us. Douglas, 
that's not how I remember it. It all goes back three years ago. The summer, everything changed. Barry, I literally was just sitting outside Barisha and Blues and they filled the other three seats one day. Douglas, Barry, it was French of a first sight. Why would you question these things? So in answer to the original question, I somehow had even less clue how, how people made friends. But their chosen hunting ground, Paul Street, was home to so many miscellaneous groups. Populated by kids with dyed hair, dark clothes, skateboards, and loud laughs. It was a home from home, one filled with floating emos and weirdos. Down the street edges of Paul Street, there was a little street and an empty alleyway. The alleyway proved popular with teens who had procured balls of alcohol and other things, and couples who had snuck away from their groups to each, each other's faces. When we passed such things, Adam always looked shyly, perhaps fearing that if he caught his eye, he would suddenly plunge into a world of religious, uh, illicit sex and drugs without warning. He seemed so easily frightened by this, I told him he was destined never to have a girlfriend. I was wrong about that, as it turned out. Yeah. Oh, Keith, thank you so much. This, the thing that really, um, it, that reading reminds me of is how strong the setting is, how vivid the setting is in your story, like that you really contextualise, that I can see in full living colour where they are every corner they turn. And of course, I think your editor was quite right to encourage you to uh, talk about the moment when, you know, this character finds his tribe in a way, because that's such yeah. an important part of young, the young adult's journey is to find who you belong to, is to explore your um, identity. And often it, it involves a search, you know, and you kind of described that in that extract. So. Thanks a million. Oh my gosh, what, what rich pickings. I wanted to ask you all, and I'm going to just go to each of you in turn, about your own um, life context and influences, because you've reaped for some incredibly emotionally resonant moments that speak to things like mental health and well-being um, um, among people, young adults in particular. Is there something from your own lives and your own context and your own experiences that you'd like to share with us? that might have been the trigger for these extraordinary stories. Can I start? Um, uh, I'll go, yeah, I'll just go the normal, um, just the way we, we do it. So I'll go to James first, and then Kira, and then Keith. Well, I suppose uh, for me, I, my mother died when I was 10, right, suddenly. Um, and it was one that was a huge effect. And at the time, you know, we didn't even weren't allowed to go to a funeral, or it was all about trying to Batten down those feelings. Um, so I suppose that's that come into this very much. And also, I think being a teacher, well, having two kids of my own one, and then having uh, been a teacher for a child, and just seeing the resilience, seeing the, the difficulties maybe that parents had, kids had. Uh, but, you know, it was just a fabulous resilience in, in, in those kids. And it was, uh, so it was something, no matter what was happening, I just wanted the, the hero, Kevin. In a way to celebrate that that heroism and that resilience, um, I suppose that's the, the that would be the they would be the main ones I think. And I suppose the other ones are role model. I suppose for me that I think kids you know they're desperate to have whether it's a, a good friend. I think the thing of being alone or alone that, that aloneness is probably young adults probably dread and I think it's they need to have or the desire to have someone who can be either a friend, a good friend that they can be themselves with, or else uh, or whether it's an older brother or whether it's a, 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 whether a parent or an uncle or whatever, a teacher. I think teachers are crucial. So I think with my book I was I would say that I mean, the joke was I would say Harry Potter was spoiled in the sense that he had he was given so much in the book, he was given magic, he was given Hagrid, he was given all this uh, Dumbledore. He had these wonderful access to all this magic, and he had this, the best one with the lot, and he had great. Thing. So I was just contrasting that with poor Kevin. I said, I'm going to give him nothing. I'm going to make him small. He wants to be a goalkeeper. I think, uh, you know, so that's that was my probably part of, of where I was coming from. Uh, but I suppose that yeah. whole thing then was yeah. the last thing I'd say was just with Kevin. I think that was important for me that there's suppressed grief there that he's never come to terms with that grief where he sees probably a, a, a boy who looks just like him 
uh, and that he's wearing, you know, he's taking the jersey out, and he sees that, he's seen that boy um, express verbally and sort of physically his, his, the, the anger and the frustration and the sadness of his dad's death, and it's probably, it's helping him in some way, because even though that boy, Connor, has so much more, he's kind of wealthy and has this beautiful house and he's got so much, Adam never feels envy or uh, jealousy because I think he sees with, with Connor that everything is tinged with sadness. You know what I mean? The house becomes tinged, the garden, everything, uh, the shed where the dad died is, is, that's where, you know, he's in there and he does a pool room there and whatever. There's beautiful stuff there, but everything is tinged with sadness. So I suppose that's, maybe I suppose that sadness has tinged my life. You know, my mother dying suddenly and maybe it's, it's probably writing has been in my guilt. Nobody asked about how you were doing. You know what I mean? But it's the older, you were healthy. <laughs> I didn't want to know about it, I suppose. No. I know. And, 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 yeah, thank you, Derek, for sharing that with us. Because, like, I, you know, as I read that book, I felt that the experience, you know, that you're, you weren't just talking about a theoretical experience of grief. It felt that it came from a very deep place of your own experience. And I think it's really interesting for children who have lost a parent because on one hand, they need people to notice that and be alert to that. But on the other hand, they don't want to be treated differently to anybody else. So it's that incredible paradox. And I think you hold that so beautifully. And to know that that comes, at least in part, from the own resilient boy you used to be, I think that's just so inspiring. Um, and I'm sure it took a lot of courage to go to that place as well. So, um, and with such impact, you know, with such great storytelling impact. Thank you so much. What about you, Keith? And do you want to tell us a little bit about how your own experiences or influences or, where, where, you know, I know it's, a, it's such a cliche to say, where did you get the idea for this book? But it's, uh, you know, it's such um, a powerful and, you know, in, in some ways, it deals with such a shocking topic that people find so taboo, and yet you've just gone for it. Um, what was the thing that, that encouraged you to do that? Um, it's actually the actual inspiration for the book came from um, about hour two into a three hour air coach bus ride. Uh, so it was kind of on the way, I was just thinking about. Um, I just, I, I always, ever since I was a kid, um, there's like a photo of me, like hugging, like as a baby, hugging like a small goat, uh, like inflatable one, not natural goat. But uh, and it was kind of, and I was thinking about like, oh, what would it happen if you were haunted by yourself? And then I kind of just teased the idea out, and then it was kind of like, well, this kind of, it ended up this being seemed like the most natural story to tell, you, especially because I'd been uh, uh, reading a lot about mental health re uh, at the time, and because there was, I think there was just a general. Uh, as, as Jade's saying, like, and now I think there's more of a conversation around it. So there's, I think there's more people talk about it more. So I think it'd be it's easier to talk about. Uh, so in terms of my actual like real life, um, I I feel like um, it was interesting because a lot of it was trying to depict. I felt what was like my kind of teenage years were closer to. So like the characters in it, the friends he makes, are very much of a particular type <laughs> that I don't often, I think, end up on um, books or films or things like that. So just like the strange kids that hang out in a public spot <laughs> uh, without a massive amount to do. Um, so like kind of stackers kind of thing. But, uh, but you know, so it was kind of, I thought it was, in, I thought it was good. I kind of wanted to replicate not uh, in a way what my teenage years were like, which was a lot of sitting around with skaters, uh, listening to terrible new metal. Um, <laughs> but uh, it also just have cork in a YA book. <laughs> Everyone, every cork writer is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's the strange kids are the ones that are most interesting to write about because you know everyone is everyone feels like a strange kid i think when they're when they're growing up and um adam's story is a gift i think that technique as well of splitting adam you know if you you know the idea of haunting yourself i think that's such a clever technique because that's what everybody does you know we all haunt ourselves we have our 
we sometimes split into the person that we want to be and the person we really are. We present this mask and I mean, without being too Freudian, we have our, our super ego that we go out into the world with, but then we have all the secrets that we know about ourselves. And um, to be able to play with that in the fictional device that you use, I think is just pure genius. And of course, it harks back to people like Brian Friel. I mean, one of my favorite plays is Philadelphia, Here I Come. I don't know if you've um, come across it, Keithan, but um, uh, I know of this, but I regret to have not read it. <laughs> oh, Keithan, like you're like it's like he's like Adam's, you know, grandfather. Do you know what I mean? Fictional grandfather, yeah. or he would be now, um, where he's leaving for um, America, and he's trying to tell his dad all these things that he can't. They just simply cannot tell each other the things. It really harks back a little bit, I think, to what James was saying earlier about people just not talking about stuff. And there's so many things he wants to say and he's so full of anger and love and new beginnings and letting go of the past. And he, so instead he has this kind of alter ego who dances around the stage saying all the things that he wishes he could say. And it's really clever. And I, some of what your um, device in uh, Tuesdays Are Just As Bad did was remind me of that. So definitely check it out. It's, it's really, it speaks, oh, I think, sure. to your fictional voice. Um, Keith and brilliant. I didn't mean to go down that particular um, uh, meander there, but it's just oh, that it occurred. Okay. Um, Kira, I'd love you to talk a little bit more to us about the dementia piece. I'm particularly interested in this. My first novel was all about dementia. I didn't set out to write about it, but it, in the way that these things do, it bubbled to the surface because my own dad was experiencing dementia at the time and in fact died uh, just before the book was published. Um, and so in a way, my first novel is kind of a love letter to my dad and a kind of a, a cry of grief around what happened to him. I'd love to know where you got, where, how you decided to include this, because I think it's a really important area to talk about. And it's so, such a common experience and it's so difficult for people to talk about it. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that aspect of the story. Um, I think that I, <sighs> in some ways sort of reverse engineered it in that um it wasn't it didn't it didn't really come up first it wasn't the first thing that i thought of that i was going to write a book about a character whose mother had um dementia but um i was sort of thinking about why this character would be the way that she is and why she's so sort of obstinate about sticking to her her um her rules i guess and um my partner at the time was working with older people and um also a social worker and um told me this story about this man who if you've read the book you'll recognize this story is that he would go to his wife's um nursing home on his birthday and bring her a present to give to him and i just like that uh, that was just so devastating and i just thought like how it just really made me think about how much you might love someone and if that had happened when they were young they were much older you know that kind of thing that Sears's dad is dealing with where he really does love his wife but she's not really there anymore and he's 40 and you know she feels so betrayed that he wants to have a relationship with someone else because she sort of sees it as well if you love her you should be with her forever no matter what um and sort of throughout the book she's kind of coming to terms with the fact that it, he does still love her it just looks different now um but i think that kind of the way that people sort of deal with their feelings i find endlessly fascinating because often we just do the exact opposite thing the thing that's worst for us um but at the time you just think well that's all i can do i don't have another choice um but i think that and i read i read i started to read a lot about people who had um who weren't sure if they were going to have a diagnosis of dementia because it was running in their family and sort of the idea of living with that kind of uncertainty i just think how would you live 
your life, you know, it must be take incredible strength. And what if you're 17 and you think that's going to happen to you? What, how is that going to affect what you do? Um, so I think with my job, I think I always, I'm trying really hard to understand why people do things that the people around them get frustrated by or annoyed by, or, you know, why are you doing this? I don't understand why you're doing this. So, yeah, I think that kind of comes into into play a lot, to try and understand why people react the way that they do. Yeah, and it's just huge empathy there. Like, I, I, I mean, I was a grown woman with children of my own when my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but it brought out the angry child in me because I remember so many times feeling angry with him and then feeling so guilty for being angry and all those weird feelings and, you know, and also exactly as you say, you know, when you're forming your identity for somebody who is so important in the establishment of your identity to be fading away, it's just catastrophic for people. And again, it's it's an experience that people encounter and to try and get inside the head of that experience, I think, is part of what your your story does and it does it so um so brilliantly i can't believe we're nearly getting to the end of the hour and i feel like we've only scratched the surface and i could talk to you guys all day and probably not run out of things to ask you but i did want to ask all of you about uh your writing process and in particular because the focus is mental health on whether you think writing has an effect on your own mental health, either good or maybe sometimes bad, because I know myself writing can be very stressful, especially when you're a published author and people are expecting deadlines and um, and you have to deal with editorial uh, notes and um, and navigate all of this. It's it's a it's a very big job, and you have to navigate all the business side of things while also finding that honest voice that allows you to write the kind of beautiful stories that you write. So maybe I can ask you all about that a little bit. James, what, what's writing? What does it do for you? Is it a therapeutic thing? Um, what are the what's the light and dark of writing um, for like you? For, like for you? Well, for me, I suppose it gives a focus uh, to the day. Anyway, definitely. Um, and also, I suppose there's a huge element. I suppose that whole notion of play. I used to love, you know, love play as a kid. And uh, I think it's funny in a sense. You know, the kids maybe four or five year olds who have an imaginary friend, and they're you know they're told to give up that imaginary friend. I think writers were really probably just kids with, in some sense, where we spend hours with imaginary, just playing with our imaginary friends in some way. And we get so much, there's no one there saying, Jesus, come in from that shed there, you spend four hours out there. It's like people actually want to hear about your your, your friends and that. So there is that element too, which is, which is, which I find great. And I suppose the other thing for me, I suppose I was never very good, say, in a social group. I wouldn't be to, to tell a joke. I would find that very difficult and to have just to be, I'd be self-conscious and not remember it. But I found, you know, that notion maybe I could write humor. Um, so I could have someone else in the story given a good line or whatever. And I think that's a huge thing for me is just to be able to express probably who I am uh, in the writing. And the other thing is I was uh, I was a teacher who used to be writing part-time and now I have to say, well, I'm now a writer and I can teach part-time. And it's, I suppose it's probably, for me, it's been a process of letting people know who I am, actually. This is what, I, I, this is what I'm saying. And I think it's only when you actually start writing that you, you kind of, you know exactly uh, what it is, what you want to say. And it's probably just showing, that thing for me was showing myself you know, to a, to a wider audience. Uh, that's probably been a, a huge thing, yeah. That's, that's so insightful. And I think a lot of people who'll be tuning into this discussion will be young people interested in writing as well as uh, in reading books. And so that, you know, just finding out who you are a bit, like put, throwing things down in a kind of experimental, playful way on paper, yeah. Uh, without any expectation about where it's going to go. It's deeply creative. And, and you spoke a little bit to that point, James. Thank, thanks a million. Kira, how about you? Um, I'm a lot more cynical, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like I, um, yeah, like I do find it, I pop my own feelings into um, what I'm doing a lot, even if it's in a very different context. Um, but um, I find that sometimes it can affect how the book works out. Um, 
you know, whatever's going on in my life will just sort of like somehow find its way in there, even if it's a different situation. It's that those same feelings that I have I'll put into something. But um I think definitely balancing um writing and a day job. I don't like calling my job a day job because I love my jobs and I, I just think that makes it sound like it's I'd rather not have it and I actually I wouldn't give it up um yeah. but sometimes when I'm at work all day and then I come home and I'm like oh my god I have to do more stuff because I have a deadline that can be that can be really stressful because you, you don't really have any free time I remember free time once um but at the same time you know sometimes the I have struggled a little bit and it has affected my emotional well-being, I guess, the kind of book world, book Twitter, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and But I have found having a day job has also helped in that sense because kind of, you know, I can get really like focused in and honed in on something either, you know, something in the book isn't working right or, you know, that kind of world kind of becomes a bit overwhelming and then I go to work the next day and I'm like oh hold on there's other stuff <laughs> this is not the only oh, thing yeah that's so good because I I'm like just like you Kira. I have a really busy full-time job and I I also I don't know why I introduced you um, as having a day job because I completely get that I don't like calling it a day job I love what I do I'm an academic in UL and I do a lot of teaching and research. I get to research things like creativity, which is really complementary to my to my own writing. But like that, you know, I think it was Stephen King who said, you need, you know, to make it to make the pearl, you need a bit of grit. You need to be out there in the world. You need to have experienced things. And I don't think I'd have the mental capacity to be a full time writer. I think I'd just go mental. I think I'd go crazy. <laughs> Because um, that balance, that ability to switch off, I think, is really important. Um, and so I, I really admire full-time writers because I think they have some sort of inner peace that allows them to do this thing all the time, which I, I don't think I'd ever be able to, to cut it at all. No, for sure. I think if it was me, I'd be in it. I, I might turn my house into a cave and it would look like one of those murder boards, you know, with like red strings <laughs> everywhere. And I'd just be like, you know, gone mad. But um but yeah, so I think that can <laughs> bit of balance. Yeah, true. And for those people listening in who are really busy doing so many other things that want to write, I mean, I for one can tell you this because I've done it. You can write a novel in 15 minutes a day as long as you write every day and then maybe go off into one of those crazy caves for a week or so and, and pull it all together. Um, I mean, I know everyone's process is different, but managing time and having something to do during the day, it, even though it does add to the workload and stress, it can be a blessing as well as a challenge. Um, and I think Kira has told us a little bit about that. Uh, Keithan, what's writing like for you? Um, <clears throat> um, I've always gone by that. What's that? I think it's Darcy Parker line was like, I don't like writing, but I like having written. So it's that um, I I very much like when I was writing this, it was very much just as a, you know, a grabbing time kind of thing where it's like, I make sure I'll write 500 words a day kind of thing. Because I, I can't remember which writer is now, but they were saying that they would literally only write 500. They would stop mid-sentence once they reached 500. Uh, I wasn't quite as rigorous as that, but uh, I definitely, it was just continuous and, fi and like, it is one of those things where, like, it can be sometimes difficult to see. I think where writers get time, because especially uh, with online stuff, things like that, you're never going to show people the, oh, I got, you're never going to tell the days you had nothing written. You tell the days you got, oh, I got this many things written. So, um, yeah, I find this, um, I, I find it, I try and keep it interesting myself. I'm always one of those writers that um, I always write quite, sparsely and then I build up um, because I never edit down I edit up <laughs> um, but uh, it is uh, so I kind of just again it's one of those things it's just keeping consistent and um, also like you kind of sometimes have to mix it up for yourself um, I recently started experimenting with like a transcription app just to you know just make it a bit different to see how it goes 
it, 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 unfortunately, my transcription app is not very good, so it just ends up reading like William Burroughs, but it's uh, there. <laughs> it's the first draft. <laughs> um, wonderful. Guys, as I said, I'd love to spend the rest of the day chatting to you, but I think we are under um, some time restriction, so I'm going to um, wrap up, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you for your generous readings and for the lovely insights that you've brought naturally to this discussion which focuses on, on on mental health i mean i think the great comfort to be got simply from the stories that you've written the resilience of kevin searsha's just incredible authenticity through everything that she experiences the complexity of adam but also that that humor and that lovely dichotomy that you've created these are amazing creations and i'm so glad to have got to talk to the originators of them. I, I, I do believe that the right book in at the right time in uh, the life of a young adult can, can literally be their rescue and their comfort and maybe sometimes their salvation. And that's the importance of the work you do. So never underestimate if you ever have a moment where your self-belief is flagging or you're worried about whether you you should be in this game at all. Stay in the game, guys. You've done wonderful work. And it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to the three of you. I can't wait to see what you guys do next. And I hope that the next meeting will be in person um, over a beer or at least in the flesh. Um, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Um, I'm going to declare it complete and over and out. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.